Whether you're just starting out on your electronics adventures and just need to verify a five band resistor, or like myself, you've accumulated a whole bunch of components over the years and not quite sure what they are or whether they're still functioning. So this is a 10k ohm resistor. This component tester will help you out. It's extremely flexible and it says transistor tester but it can do so much more and we'll be finding out how to build that. The capacitor here, 1000 microfarads, equivalent series resistance 0 0.09 so this is a good guy. Inductors, clearly this is an inductor and we can see there it's uh, 21 microhenries. But what about this guy? It's got a coil on it but is it a resistor or is it an inductor? No prizes for guessing, it's a 15 ohm resistor. So we can play with this all day and uh, can have lots of fun. Kit is supplied with this little single in line socket and that enables you to be able to test uh, much smaller components more easily. So they just slip in there. And we can see that's an NJFET and a nice little diagram of it. A very flexible little unit. Let's see how we can build one. This is how the kit arrives, the case. Um, we have to sort the, uh, the, the front panel out and we have a bunch of screws and spacers and looks like the connector for the LCD and also um, a ZIF uh, zero insertion force socket. I see that they've modified the case now. There were some comments left uh, I think on earlier revisions um, that mod wasn't made and people had soldered this to the board and then couldn't uh, couldn't fit it. And in the magic box here a whole raft of goodies. Looks like there's actually another ZIF socket in, in there. Have to be careful not to lose any of the smaller components. Obviously we have here the LCD panel, uh, printed circuit board, and a bunch of components. Again on the comments section in uh, on the Banggood website, um, there are no instructions with the kit. So that's one of the reasons for the, the video today. The circuit board is very clearly labeled with the component values there. So we just have to be uh, careful to choose the correct components to, to, to place them. And uh, as always, it seems the resistor values are in the five band code. And that's not always uh, straightforward to decipher what the values are with the five band code. So it's always a good idea to double check with a meter before you fit something to the circuit board to make sure it's uh, absolutely correct. Similarly with the capacitors, uh, obviously it would be a lot easier if you had a component tester, which is one of the reasons why we're building it. But um, they're quite, quite clearly marked, uh, this being a 104 and it may even be time to get the microscope out for some of these components. So let me sort these into their relevant piles. When building these kits, it's a good idea to start with the lowest profile components first, which will obviously be the resistors. So we'll get the resistors sorted out and then we'll get those soldered on. Here's an example of why the five band color code is, is sometimes difficult to interpret. Here under the microscope with its own light, the colors are not, uh, not very distinct. If I change the light source, turn off the microscope light and put on a proper video light, we can now see the colors uh, much more clearly. Going from left to right, we have brown, which is one, black, which is zero, another black, zero, and red, which is two and the final brown on the right hand side is the tolerance which is 1%. So 100 and the multiplier red means 100. So this is a 10k ohm 
resistor. This is why it's very important to double check the resistance with a multimeter because as you can see it's easy under different lighting conditions to confuse the colors. We will just double double check that we've got the right components here. So 9.9k 1% so these are the, the 10k resistors and as we saw before the positions for the components are clearly marked on the boards there so there's two 10k's required here let's get soldering take care when cutting the component leads flush with the board don't let the pieces just ping around everywhere because they will surely find their way somewhere where they're definitely not wanted. With all the resistors now in place, we can get on to the next components, which are going to be the capacitors. The capacitors, for the most part, are clearly marked. There is a number of 104s, a 103, two 22 picofarads, and a lone 1 nanofarad. So this guy is marked as a 1NJ, again, clearly marked on the, on the circuit board here as 1NJ as well. So we can't, can't go too far wrong with that. There are two electrolytic capacitors which are polarized. So we have to pay attention when fitting them. The negative side is, is marked. And again, on the circuit board, the negative side is indicated by the lines here and obviously the positive and another thing the positive lead on the capacitor is is longer so no problems with that there is another capacitor included but this is not part of the build this is for calibrating the unit once we get to that step so we can put that to, to one side for the moment let's get these caps installed With the capacitors now in place, we can move on to the next part. Just one observation. With these two small 22 picofarad capacitors, don't push them or force them down onto the board too far. Now, they have to be below the height of these spacers because of the LCD, but if you try and force them all the way down to the circuit board, they're going to crack. These are are only small ceramic capacitors, so I wouldn't uh, push them down any further than you see here. I've put the spacers on to give me a reference for the height, because the next thing that we're going to fit are the transistors. Now, obviously, we could put them with just a small part of their legs through the board, and then they would stick up too high. So now we have a reference point. Uh, my next challenge is trying to work out the numbers. You can just about make them out there, but uh, I think that's another job for my microscope. So the first one out of the hat is uh, a 9014. And again, clearly marked on the circuit board, the flat and the round side. So it's going to go in like that. But just paying attention to the height. Let's just wiggle it down. Now we can see that it is below the level of the spacer here, so we're golden. Next we're going to fit the rest of the components, so the clip for the battery, switch, the socket for the processor, uh, the crystal, and the socket for the LCD, and of course the zero insertion force socket, the ZIF socket. Now, as we saw at the beginning, uh, two of those supplied for some reason. They have the same part number. But my preference is for this guy because uh, it, it brings back memories. Um, back in the day, I had to make um, EEPROM programmers for a specific job. 
In those days, you thought yourself blessed if you had 8K bits of, uh, of memory to, to play with, and if you left it on the windowsill, um, it would erase itself. It's a UV erasable little window on the top there to expose the chip. Happy days. Just a few notes about uh, mounting the hardware. We have a connector at the top there for the LCD, and that's marked as 5 through 12. Now that matches up with the header that you solder onto the LCD, which starts at pin 5. So that's how that works. Take a little bit of care with the crystal. The crystal is, is glass inside, so uh, don't, uh, don't overstress the legs on that. Uh, the socket um, has an indication for pin 1, a little uh, dent in the, in the top there. So that indicates that this top corner is pin 1. And finally, the LED is marked again on the, on the circuit board. It has a flat on, on this side to indicate the, the negative lead. And similarly, I think to the capacitors, the positive leg of the LED is, is longer. So we're almost at a point of, uh, of, of testing. It's a good idea though just to double check. Um, we'll connect a battery up and check the power connections on the chip here before we put it in just to make sure that everything is, is good. And to do that uh, we count down to pin 7 uh, which should be positive and pin 22 should be negative and they're opposite each other. And we can see there are 5 volts, so we can be happy that we can put the chip in now. As the chip is supplied, the legs are probably going to be a little bit too splayed out to fit in the socket. So just gently on an anti-static surface, just bend the pins over so that they're pointing straight down. We'll disconnect the battery for the moment. Once again, pin 1 is the indentation on the top there. And just check that uh, all the all the pins have gone home. Fit the LCD panel. Now we can reconnect our battery and test it. Excellent. So uh, we can see that it's working. What we need to do now is to calibrate it. Obviously, it's telling us it's it's not calibrated. So we'll go through that process. To calibrate the units, we need to make up a, a linking wire to join the one, two, and three terminals. Now, the first three positions are one. The middle position is two next to this uh, line that you can see in the in the ZIF socket and then the final three are three. So that needs to go in like that. To calibrate it, I've actually already been through the calibration procedure so it remembers it. Um, if you switch it on for the first time it will prompt you to do the calibration as we saw. Uh, thereafter you have to go into the menu and select the calibration yourself. So let's go ahead and do that. Go into the menu and spin down to the self-test. Short probes, we've done that. You can go back and view all of this data later in, in the menu. So now we're at the point where it says isolate probes, so we remove our shorting link. So now it's prompting us to put uh, the test capacitor between 1 and 3. So we'll do that like that. And that is the calibration complete. Just as a quick test, I'm going to look at this uh, capacitor. So it's uh, 1000 microfarads 
and with electrolytic capacitors um, make sure that there's no residual charge left in by shorting the, the pins out. Um, these devices don't have much in the way of protection and uh, it's quite easy to, to zap it. We'll put our component in. And there we have it, so uh, 1031 microfarads, uh, the loss there. And very important for, for my purposes, it actually gives you uh, an evaluation of the ESR. Here in a hot environment, electrolytic capacitors do dry out uh, much more rapidly. And uh, the sign of that is the increasing uh, ESR value. So the next challenge will be fitting it into the case. When attempting to fit the module into the case, we encounter a problem. I thought it had been addressed when I saw the, the, the cutout here for this type of uh, ZIF socket. But when we offer the parts up now, because of the height of the LCD panel, the ZIP socket is, is recessed and you can't even get the uh, nut onto the switch here. What I'm going to try is we can see the, the height of the LCD here. I'm going to enlarge this cutout in the screen to accommodate that so that it passes through and we'll see then how close we are to uh, be able to get this to fit. Here is the completed tester and the modification that I had to do to be able to get the LCD to fit um, seemed to work okay. So literally just a rectangular cutout for the uh, for the display to to poke through there a bit. I've also opened up the rest of this hole. It was only open down to there, and that didn't enable the latch to close fully. And you'll you'll need that. So that those are the only two modifications that I I needed to do to the case. You could of course just use the module as you saw before on the bench. But as uh, sure as eggs is eggs, one day you'll put it down on something conductive and, and blow it to bits. So I think it's a much neater arrangement to put it in the case, even though you have a little modification to do. My thanks go to Banggood for supplying this kit, and I hope you have as much fun building it as I did.